Our next speaker, Kevin Iwaki, is founder of Gitcoin.co, an Ethereum-based network for growing open source software with incentivization mechanics. He has a BS in computer science, 10 years of engineering leadership experience in startups and open source software, and is a community organizer in the Boulder, Colorado tech scene. Kevin believes strongly that open source software development should be sustainably funded. Gitcoin, a one-stop shop that gives software developers the skills and connections to survive and thrive in this new blockchain ecosystem. Please welcome Kevin. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Iwaki. I am the founder of Gitcoin, which is a place that if you're a software engineer, you can use to get coins in exchange for doing software development. I have flown out from Boulder, Colorado, where I'm a meetup organizer in the Colorado blockchain scene. And we are proudly funded by Consensus, the largest blockchain venture studio in the world, primarily based on Ethereum. So the, the talk that I'm giving today is entitled The Gig Economy, Dangerous Monopolies Uncoupled by Decentralization. And in order to frame the context of what I think is going to happen to jobs, um, I think the future of jobs is going to be primarily web-based in the future, and Gitcoin is sort of a manifestation of that. In order to frame my talk, I want to talk about what the web will become. And as a means of doing this, I've got this screenshot of the main characters from a television show on AMC called Halt and Catch Fire. Has anyone seen that show on AMC? <laughs> okay, yeah. So the, this scene is the main character sitting around a conference table in 1993 and asking themselves, so we know about this thing called HTTP, and there's this company calling out with, coming out with Mosaic, and what they want to do is build an information superhighway. What does that look like? What is the web going to become? And the, the entire series is, is fascinating because it starts with the PC Clone Wars and then goes into the age of AOL, and then eventually the, you follow the characters through the progression of the web. And it's interesting as an entrepreneur to, to think about that and to want to just scream through the television screen, no, it's going to be about the, the Macintosh and it's going to be about the web browser and open standards. And the, the problem is that all of this stuff is only obvious in hindsight what the web will become. And I think that we're in a similar spot with the blockchain-based internet right now where we've got Bitcoin, and we've got Ethereum, we've got Aeon, we've got all these different crypto networks. But it's not clear what they're building. If you think about the parallels with the internet revolution, basically anything that touched information got completely remade by the internet. Our media, our politics, the way we socialize with each other via social media. And so I think that blockchain is going to do for financial services what the internet did for information. And by proxy, in this analogy, I want to tell you that I think that anything that touches financial services has the potential to be changed by blockchain. And uh, what, where is a place that humans spend a lot of their lives? They spend a lot of their lives at work. And I think there's a fundamental bias right now where we think about the blockchain web in terms of speculation and investments, and we're not talking about DeFi jobs or self-sovereign jobs. So that's what I think the web is going to become. And I'm here to talk about jobs in the information age, specifically what's at stake as we move into the information age. So another context setting slide. If you think about the different epochs that we've seen in human history of coordination between bands of humans in order to gain resources to do reproduction, uh, basically, I think that the major epochs are the hunter-gatherer age, where work was basically hunting or gathering food, uh, to the agricultural revolution, in which the majority of the population moved to farms, settled in one place, uh, started to accumulate wealth, and work in, in that age 
uh, changed when we moved to the Industrial Revolution with the advent of the mechanical clock, with uh, the modern legal system, and an exodus from farms into, into major cities. And then arguably, we're in the middle of another revolution in how work is done now, uh, at least from my limited vantage point, uh, most of the people that I socialize with are information workers, people who do knowledge work, who do things like data entry or software engineering or creative design. And, and I think that it's, it's kind of super interesting to, to remember that we've all come up with this limited human memory of I'm 35 years old, and, and for me, the way work has always been defined has been sort of based off of, steeped in, in the mantra of the epoch of the Industrial Revolution, and it's just, it's interesting to zoom out and to realize that it wasn't always that way in human history. So, uh, to zoom in a little bit, I think that uh, one of the the trends that's sort of capturing the future of work conversation right now is the gig economy. And I hope that if I leave you with one message from my presentation today, it's that the gig economy that we see right now is just the tip of the iceberg. And the gig economy I think that's hot right now is brands like Upwork, like TaskRabbit, like Uber or Fiverr, where you can give a taxi ride to someone in exchange for your money, or do a task on Upwork, a creative task for uh, in exchange for money. And I think that the reason why those are just limited is because the way human markets work and the information that are passed on them is just sort of changing as we become a network species and we approach Dunbar's number. Um, and and the, you see, this sort of fracture happening in the press when people talk about their experiences with Upwork, where basically if there's a dispute, then Upwork penalizes you and then discusses later uh, how you can improve. And sometimes, because they're such a growth mindset kind of company, don't even get to, you don't even get resolution on your task if you're a worker. Um, and arguably, with Uber filing for its IPO, their entire marketplace is based upon an assumption from a legal perspective of not classifying their workers as employees. So think about that. They're about to IPO for several billion dollars in the whole system, the whole case they're making to the, the financial markets that none of these people who work on their network are employees. That, that's, the, that's what the entire IPO hinges upon. Um, I think that there's a parallel with, with Upwork and with Uber to what, uh, what we've seen in the retail markets with, uh, and, and I guess the, the, the pattern that I've seen in my hometown from southeastern Pennsylvania is that Walmart will come in and it'll lower prices for a certain amount of time, uh, it, uh, long enough to make it so that it's not profitable to run your mom and pop shop or to run whatever local chain is around. And then once the mom and pop stores are out of business, then they'll raise prices again because there's, there's no competition. And so I really worry about what's gonna happen to say the taxi industry in New York City and when Uber and Lyft have completely started to dominate and there's, and there's no more competition from a taxi perspective. And you can take this monopolistic phenomena and you can apply it across N industries. Uh, another thing I think sort of points out the problem with our modern gig economy based off of the legacy internet is uh, with, with LinkedIn and the way they monetize our data. So, my resume is available to me that I've written it based off of my own work history and it's a story fundamentally that's about me. But when I upload it to LinkedIn or any other job site, then they are basically treating me as inventory that they're selling to recruiters or whatever their business model is. And LinkedIn makes, I think the number is, it's either 26 or 30 something dollars per user per year 
off of your data, just selling your data to recruiters. Um, I'm a big fan of, of Glenn Weil, who's an economist in the blockchain scene who's been talking about data as labor and how consumers should have ownership of their data and the data emissions that they have and be, have an opportunity to make a, a profit off of them. And I think that that's a trend that I would really like to see come to fruition and I hope that legacy players like LinkedIn will embrace that. So what's the design space of my talk? What would, how is the, what's at stake as, as work changes? Well, first of all, humans spend most of their waking hours at work if they're in the working class, which I think many of us in this room are. And as we move from the industrial age to the information age, what did jobs look like? What will happen to workers displaced by AI and VR and all these other futuristic buzzwords? It's a really good documentary on Vice right now on HBO that talks a little bit about an AI perspective on future work, which I encourage you all to check out. What happens to things that are bundled with work? Things that my parents could rely on healthy benefit packages, retirement packages, insurance, things of that nature. Where is your job sovereign to? If you're a refugee, or if you're someone who is in an area of the world that has hyperinflation, do you want to be paid in a specific local currency? And how many workers uh, are, can only have, provide access to work through an intermediary like Upwork or Uber or another profit-driven company that is, um, that is optimized through the, through the letter of the law to produce re returns for shareholders and not necessarily for workers. And I guess that's just another way of saying how do you balance the needs of capital and labor. So I think that fundamentally we're entering a new design space with the advent of Bitcoin. And the reason that I think that is that I think that if we, if we believe that the new internet of money is gonna be the underpinning of all sorts of financial assets, then it's gonna touch everything that finance touches, jobs included. So the design space that I'm really interested in is blockchain plus software development jobs because that's Gitcoin's business and some of these things will extrapolate into other skilled jobs and some of them won't. So from first principles, we value software development and with programmable money, we can now program our values into our money. And so we can make software development profitable for software engineers. Um, the internet has brought us a thousand X usage of information services. Compare I am an email to what you used to do with US Postal Service. I think the blockchain will eventually bring us a thousand X use case of financial services. And so, the big question I think in everyone's mind right now is what is the breakthrough application for open, open source financial ecosystem? And then one of the really nice things from Gitcoin's perspective is that, you know, I talked in the last slide about the divide between capital and labor. Well, in the blockchain space, there's $100 billion to $900 billion in market cap on these crypto networks, depending on, depending on the month, and everyone needs software developers so everything is gonna be increasingly built by open source software developers and there's a supply and demand imbalance between capital and labor that creates good conditions for software developers. So what people think blockchain looks like uh, is that I think that we've got this sound money layer at the very bottom, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, other, other networks that allow you to have self-sovereign wealth. There seems to be a big trend towards layer two, which allows scalability of economic throughput. And then on top of that is a bunch of dApps that are built for trading and speculation and, uh, and hodlers. But I think that the future looks way more like this. So basically anything that touches financial services is going to be affected by the blockchain internet. And so I think that the, the top social layer on, on this chart is gonna look much less like just DeFi, and we're gonna see peer-to-peer -peer markets for compute resources and peer-to-peer -peer networks for jobs, and maybe the burner wallet will be used in retail because you can save 3% of your transaction fees using a, a crypto network instead of Visa and MasterCard. Mm. So this is the design space that we work on at Gitcoin. 
uh, I really hope that we're creating a world in which uh, work not only compensates well, but it aligns with our values as workers and as a society, and it has a positive impact on the world. Uh, the way that we articulate this at Gitcoin is that our mission is to grow and sustain open source software. We think that there's an orthodoxy in the world that open source software is not valued, and we think that open source creates billions of dollars a year in economic value, and people aren't able to capture that value. So it's sort of an orthodoxy that we've used. It's our mission to grow and sustain open source software. And I think that there was this, there was this mantra in the 2017 bull market that if you had a human and you put in a token, you'd get out in action. And it just didn't turn out to be true. <laughs> uh, what we found, Gitcoin doesn't have a token, but we found that having a surfacing work to people that gives them not only a good compensation, but the ability to have an impact has been a super important way to drive value through the platform. I hope that work in the future brings benefits into the 21st century, and I, and I hope that as a worker for any company that I'm able to have equity in their success. I think it'd be really interesting if the future of work is peer-to-peer. -peer. So the internet took a thousand songs and put them into my pocket on my iPod or my iPhone. What's gonna happen when you can unbundle a bank and put it into your pocket? Will you still get a mortgage from a bank or will you crowdfund your next house through your through peer-to-peer your -peer network? Will jobs continue to be a one-to-many relationship with a corporation who has a monopoly on your employment? Or will you be able to jump between jobs because the, the future of work is, is fundamentally peer-to-peer? Um, I think that we're gonna see some really interesting stuff happen in the blockchain-based jobs market over the next, let's call it five years, because I think the formation of each edge in this mesh network of human beings involves both drivers and barriers. Now, in 2017, the driver to get into blockchain was that you were gonna get filthy Bitcoin rich. And so the barriers to doing that were that you had to sign up for a Coinbase account, you have to get KYC, you have to go through AML, you have to do you have to back up your seed phrase. Really big pain in the butt. And what's cool to me about 21st century jobs is that the drivers to get a job are not nearly as high as getting rich quick. But as the barriers come down to interacting with the blockchain-based internet, as we improve wallet usability, as there become more fiat on-ramps, as we get provide more access to the crypto assets and crypto networks that are that are gonna become available in the inevitable blockchain-based internet. We're gonna see more use cases for peer-to-peer -peer jobs because the barriers are gonna keep coming down and the drivers will either stay constant or they'll, they'll, they'll increase. Um, one, one hope that I have for the future of, of, uh, of work online is that it'll help us scale past Dunbar's number, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, a suggested cognitive limit with the number of people with whom we can have stable social relationships. So you can have five relationships with your kin all the way up to 150 relationships that are super casual. And if you wanna see evidence of this relationship breaking, just go spend five minutes on Twitter after this talk. <laughs> uh, so Nikki Case has a really, really great flash game, which I encourage you to check out, which allows you to sort of like game out different conditions of a system that will evolve trust. And this is a screen cap from the, the, the final score page of this game. And he basically says that if there's repeat interactions between participants in a marketplace, then trust can evolve. It's kind of like the same reason why if you're gonna see someone again, then you might be kinder to them. Uh, and, and if you're not gonna see them again, then maybe you'll flick them off in traffic or something like that. Uh, design a system for possible win-wins between different parties in the network. So if it's a zero-sum game, then it's less likely that trust will evolve in a peer-to-peer -peer network of jobs than if, if there's not. And low miscommunication is the third one. Uh, one final slide about how I hope that the future uh, of work will, will look, look like. So I would like to see triangulation costs, transfer costs, and trust costs 
come down as a result of the new blockchain-based internet. So basically triangulation is how hard it is to find and measure the quality of service. Transfer is how easy is it to bargain and agree on a contract for a good or service. And then trust is whether or not the counterparty is trustworthy and if you have recourse for if they're not. So we always hear people talking about blockchain and how it changes the way we trust each other. The reason why this matters a lot for marketplaces, whether they're a barter marketplace or a job marketplace or a financial marketplace, is that if you can lower the cost of trust, then you can increase transaction throughput. Just like the internet lowered the cost to send an email, to send a message across the world, and therefore we see a fundamentally different information architecture than we saw before. So the dream is that Gitcoin is a Swiss army knife that will provide all of these services for software engineers. We are super lucky to be serving software engineers because they have the technical acumen to use MetaMask and to back up their, their private keys. So I hope that we're, the learnings that we have from running Gitcoin will be applicable to other marketplaces for graphic design, for translation, for other 21st century information jobs. And uh, super excited to be sort of in the vanguard somewhat of this. So very quickly, uh, a couple minutes of just telling you about Gitcoin. So we're a double-sided market that connects people who want to fund software development with people who need funding in exchange for software development. And we, we kind of have this inventory on both sides of developers who are ready to go, who are looking for a job, and are not satisfied with their existing options for finding work. And then we have fresh capital from consensus or the Ethereum Foundation or basically whoever wants to drive software developers into this ecosystem, which you know you could argue that software developers are the ultimate scarce resource and a lot of these people want to drive software developers into their ecosystem and, and we sort of facilitate that transaction. Um, stats so far, we've done a little bit over a million dollars worth of platform value, so I've seen a, a, a lot of first dates in my day and this is what our mesh network of human beings look like. So basically each edge in this network is a financial transaction and each node is a, a person or organization that's hired someone else peer to peer to work with them. You can see there's sort of clustering around, around people in the, in the marketplace who've done a lot of work. All right, so I think that the gig economy as it currently exists is too narrow of a scope to think about the future of work if you're betting big on blockchain. Because the entire substrate upon which trust and value transfer happens in the world is going to change. And so the gig economy that's bolted onto the legacy financial system is just gigs because it has to be. Because the, last, uh, the old financial ecosystem doesn't support this new trust infrastructure that we're building in blockchain. But, I believe that we're creating a new category called dynamic workforce assembly. It's going to be a spectrum from gigs to part-time contracting work to full-time contracting work. And my hope is that we can layer on services that recreate what's working in the old world, benefits, retirement packages, receiving equity via tokens maybe for your work to align your incentives between both sides of the market. And one of the most amazing things about dynamic workforce assembly, if you build it on blockchain, is that you can hire anyone in the world, which just massively opens up the inventory of, of people that you can work with. And if, that might not be a big deal for us in Canada or in the United States, but if you're a refugee, if you're someone in Venezuela, if you're someone in India who wants access to, to, to funders in North America, then that's fundamentally a big deal. And you don't want to be using the legacy financial system explaining to them why you got a payment from Eastern Europe for your, for your work in software development. You just want it to show up in your wallet. So blockchain makes a big difference here. So here are some options with respect to uh, unbundling the existing dangerous gig economy monopolies that I'm very excited about. Uh, Gitcoin Bounties provides access to try before you buy relationships with software developers or funders so that you can build a relationship with a software developer anywhere across the world and our bounties range anywhere from $10 up to $10,000 and the, I think the median bounty value is, is $90. Um, 
I am really bullish on Opolis, which is a team out of Colorado that has been in the HR tech space for about 15 years, and they're pretty fed up with it. So they've built a lot of PEOs, which is just, like if you're employed by JustWorks or Trinet, then you're employed by a PEO, a professional employment organization that will administer your paycheck and your benefits. And they're working on something called a DEO, which is a decentralized employment organization. And the way that would work is that it's a smart contract and a relationship with a protocol layer that can administer benefits for you. So if you're doing bounties on Gitcoin or Bounty Zero X or Bounties Network or you're the recipient of a Gitcoin grant, then you can actually have retirement benefits and insurance in the new blockchain ecosystem. So they'll manage all of that kind of stuff in, in the new economy and I just, I, I'm really excited about that. Uh, another product that, uh, that's within the Gitcoin portfolio that I'm excited about is CodeFund, which provides recurring passive revenue from non-tracking contextual ads. So basically, the reason why this matters is that if you're a software developer who wants to monetize your audience, then you, you maybe have an audience of 15,000 people in your GitHub repo, but you have no way to support your work in open source because people don't pay for free code. You could put AdSense on your repo or on your documentation, but then you'd be selling out your customers. And so by having ethical ads that have non-tracking con context on them, you can basically monetize your audience and have passive income without having to uh, track them. And so that's the first orthodoxy that CodeFund disrupts. Turns out Facebook and Google don't even want to add uh, don't even want to advertise to blockchain projects. So the second orthodoxy is that it's one of the only players in the space that will actually do ads for blockchain companies, which is a huge market. So check out CodeFund if you're a software developer who's trying to monetize their work in open source. One other, uh, one other project that I'm really excited about is Lambda School, which has really been blowing up from a social media perspective over the last couple of years. So basically, a school that invests in you with, uh, with basically income agreements. So you don't pay anything to join Lambda School and when you graduate, if you land a job that makes, I think it's 50K or more, then you get paid out the, like you basically pay a share of your income only if you get a job, which I just think, you know, for someone who's going back to school to be a coder, that's, that's really super cool. Uh, Gitcoin Grants is a decentralized Patreon which provides recurring revenue to open source projects using EIP 1337, which basically is just the standard on Ethereum for subscriptions. So anyone who's monetized a business in, in Web2 knows how big of a deal subscriptions are, and we're just using it to create a, a Patreon that's based on crypto so no one can deplatform you. Those are the examples that I'm excited about. Uh, I wanna end my talk today by uh, again zooming out and telling you that I think that we're in the middle of a historic battle for the future history of the open internet from the founding of the Free Software Foundation in the 80s to the battles between Linux and Microsoft and the other cloud vendors in the 90s to the growth and expansion of Linux in the cloud market to what I hope will be a peer-to-peer -peer mesh network of jobs and of commerce on the internet in the future. You are here. These battles are being fought today. The future is being created between, right before our eyes, and that's a really exciting place to be. So I'll leave you with one final question, and that's what would the world look like if jobs were peer-to-peer -peer as we move into the information age? It is up to the people in this room and the people who are in this space to decide if it's a utopia or a dystopia. And I invite you to join the conversation by adding me on Twitter at uh, Adawaki or checking us out at gitcoin.co. Thank you for your time, Rebuild.